Marine Biology, Introduction to Animals. So first look at, at the classification of animals, or, or what we would call taxonomy. Um, the father of taxonomy, taxonomy being, of course, Corollis Linnaeus, <coughs> where you have that uh, hierarchical system of classification going from domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And Linnaeus also came up with binomial nomenclature <coughs> in which each organism is assigned a two-part scientific name uh, called the specific epithet and the genus name. Uh, so for us, our scientific name for humans would be Homo sapiens. Uh, so when we look at, at animals in general, we are looking at the domain. There are only three domains. Um, two of them belong to bacteria, and then we have the eukarya domain. And in the do eukarya domain, we have organisms with eukaryotic cells and eukaryotic cell type organisms are those cells that have membranous organelles, which include the mitochondria and chloroplast. And also, uh, characteristics of eukaryotic cells are that they have a true nucleus, which is what eukaryon means, that true kernel or nucleus in which the DNA is stored in. Uh, within this domain, there are four kingdoms. There is the kingdom plantae, which is uh, all the plants, kingdom protista, which are protists and algae, and these two kingdoms we already discussed in our marine biology unit. And then there's the kingdom fungi, which would be mushrooms and molds. And of course, our focus now, which would be kingdom animalia. And kingdom animalia, we're looking at multicellular organisms. Their cells lack cell walls, so we only have the cell membrane. And we are heterotrophic consumers, which means we have to ingest um, our, our food we have to ingest our food, digest our food, in order to have uh, get those organic compounds necessary to sustain life and, and keep our metabolic processes running. So uh, the, the steps there will be ingestion, digestion, and excretion. So characteristics of animals. Um, we are eukaryotic celled. Uh, we are multicellular, which means we are made up of, of more than one cell. Uh, we have our mode of nutrition is heterotrophic. Uh, whether you're an omnivore, which is uh, eat plants and animals, a carnivore eating just animals, or an herbivore, which is eat just plants. But no matter what, we are ingesting food there to obtain nutrients and materials for uh, metabolism. At some point during a life cycle, all animals are modal, which means they have movement. They move at their uh, own free will. And most, th most animals have uh, true tissues. Uh, because our, our, our cells lack cell walls, animals do not have cell walls, um, which are found in plant cells. That is that rigid structure found around the, the cell membrane of plant cells that is composed of cellulose, which is the most abundant organic compound on Earth. Animal cells do not have cell walls, but we do have our cells surrounded by an extracellular matrix that is composed of both collagen and elastic uh, glycoproteins. And if you look down here in the diagram, you could see the extracellular matrix. Uh, there is following the phospholipid bilayer there, or the plasma membrane. Um, all cells in biology have a biological membrane that is composed of phospholipids. And embedded in that are proteins, integral proteins, uh, peripheral proteins are found on one side. Uh, you also have these carbohydrate chains and proteins with uh, glycolipids or, or uh, uh, glycoproteins. Um, and of course, these are attached to the fibers of the extracellular matrix. So this extracellular matrix uh, forms a relatively flexible framework upon which cells can move about and be reorganized. And that enables, um, as far as organization, it enables animals to have complex structures. As far as reproduction, nearly all animals undergo sexual reproduction, uh, which involves the exchange of sperm and egg which are the two uh, gamete, gamete cells produced during meiosis, gametogenesis. Of course, the, uh, when you're producing sperm, that would be spermatogenesis. When you're uh, undergoing meiotic division to produce an egg, that would be oogenesis. And if you recall from uh, meiosis and biology, uh, for humans, uh, our, our gametes are haploid, so we, they only have 23 chromosomes. They have half the chromosome number, and our somatic cells, which are all, all the other body cells, are, are diploid, represented by 2M, which means they have 46 chromosomes. 
So when you have the exchange of sperm and egg uh, uh, and, and the sperm meets the egg, that would be fertilization, you restore that diploid number of chromosomes. So nearly all animals undergo sexual reproduction and that is advantageous over asexual reproduction because you have the exchange of sperm and egg, you increase the genetic variability of the offspring. And part of that is to help that, that population, you uh, introduce new characteristics that can help that organism over time become better adapt to its environment. So the, and we did some of that when we talked about our adaptations lecture. Uh, many animals are also capable of asexual reproduction. And this takes place through a process called parthenogenesis. And this is where the, the organism, the animal itself, would uh, have fertile eggs that are produced without mating. Now, uh, this is an advantage if there are no males around for mating. So these, the female animal is able to lay these fertilized eggs. Now, this decreases genetic variability in the, in the population because all the offspring are going to be genetic clones of the mother. So therefore, they're going to be uh, female as well. So nearly all animals do undergo that sexual reproduction, which is advantageous over asexual reproduction. But many animals are also capable of uh, asexual reproduction as well. And in the picture there, you can see uh, the sperm meeting the egg. So that sperm would eventually fertilize that egg. And once that, that fertilization occurs, uh, once the egg is fertilized by the sperm, you have the zygote, which is a fertilized egg. And then animals will follow a typical developmental stages. So the zygote, when it grows into a hollow sphere of cells, that is the stage of development where we call uh, it the blastula stage. And then eventually the blastula uh, will turn inside out and form a hole. And then this hole forms two separate germ layers. You have the external ectoderm layer, and then you have an internal endoderm layer. And in most cases in animal development, you have a, a layer forming in between both the ectoderm and the endoderm called a mesoderm. When this occurs, you are at the gastrula stage. And this is key in development because as animal, through animal evolution, um, these germ layers will then differentiate to form the body tissues and organs of that particular animal. So here you could see uh, the zygote, and then here you could see the eight cell stage. And at this point upon fertilization, you had meiosis forming those gametes to sperm and egg. But once fertilization occurs and you have that zygote, the cell division from here on out, unless you're forming those meiotic cells, would be mitosis. So that would divide mitotically to form the zygote, and then you go into the blastula, which is the hollow ball of cells. And there, that hollow ball there, that, that uh, hollowness area there, would be the blastocele. And then eventually you get that uh, blastula turning inside out to form the, the gastrula. And that's where you get those different layers. So you get the endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, and the blastopore. And that plays a critical role, uh, talking about the blastocele, the blastopore, and those uh, germ layers uh, when it comes to certain stages or phyla of animals. Animal origin and evolution. Um, animals are thought to have evolved from flagellated eukaryotic cells called coanoflagellates. Um, coanoflagellated cells are pictured here. Um, you'll see these in our, in our earliest, earliest uh, animals, which are the uh, sponges and the phylum periphera, because the phylum periphera, they lack true tissues, but they are made up of these cells called coanocytes. So animals have thought to evolve from coanoflagellated eukaryotic cells. Um, the first fossils that might represent animals date back to around six, uh, ten, 610 million years ago. And when we truly started to see in Earth's geological history uh, uh, during the Cambrian period, which is 542 million years ago, is where most of today's animal phyla emerged and appeared and started to diversify here on, here on planet Earth. So what do we see uh, looking at that a, a little further? Um, we have two different lines of animal development. We have the protostome animal development, and then we have the deuterostome. And if you look down here, are our simplest animals, starting with the phylum periphera, which are sponges. So you have no true tissues, no germ layers here. And then come up, you have the cnidarians, which are the jellies. You have the teniforms, which are comb jellies. Platyhelminths are flatworms. Uh, nematera are the ribbon worms. Nematoda are the roundworms. And then, of course, we start getting into 
uh, more complex animals where we have the rotifers, the rotifera, mollusca are the mollusks or soft body organisms, uh, phylomenellida, which are annelids or segmented worms, and then we have one of the most diverse groups uh, of animals, which are the phylum arthropoda, which are the arthropods, and then you start to cross over into the chordates, you start to see some chordate development in the echinodermata, although we're still at animals at this point are all invertebrates. Echinoderms are spiny skin organisms such as sea stars and so on and so forth. And then of course you have the vertebrates at the very top, which are the phylum chordata. So the uh, protostome uh, development, mouth developed first, and deuterostome development is when the anus develops first, and we'll look at that some more. Um, as far as the germ layers during the gastrulous stage, you do have the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. The ectoderm is the outer layer, outer layer which will become the skin. The mesoderm would be that middle layer which would develop into the muscles and uh, other tissue layers. And then the endoderm, which is the inside layer, would form into the gut. So here you could see where you have true tissues and germ layers begin to form. Um, the coelom, whenever you hear the coelom uh, or pseudocoelom, this refers to the body cavity. So a coelom would be a body cavity, a pseudocoelom would be a partial body, body cavities. Uh, it's like a false body cavity. And animals uh, have different types of symmetry. Um, what you'll see here is uh, radial symmetry, which is when the body parts are arranged in a wheel, kind of like that of uh, the echinoderms or a sea star, or you have bilateral symmetry, which you have both right and left sides. And you can see that in humans. We have bilateral symmetry here. So more about protostome and deuterostome development. Um, protostomed organisms include mollusks, annelids, and arthropods. Um, here you can see the cleavage. As far as the H cell stage, the cleavage is spiral and determinate in protostomes. In deuterostomes, it's radial and indeterminate. Um, the coelom formation in protostomes, which is the mollusks, annelids, and arthropods, basically the schizocelis is a solid mass of mesoderm that will split to form the coelom. So here you can see the coelom, the blastopore, and the mesoderm there. And in the deuterostomes, which is echinoderms and chordates, the enterocelis folds of an ar arcteron and forms the coelom there. And then, of course, the, one of the other key things here would be the, the fate of the blastopore. So in protostomes, the mouth develops from the uh, blastopore, and in deuterostomes, the anus will develop from the blastopore. And that's it for our introduction to animals. Um, our first group of animals to study would be sponges and jellies. Have a great day.